Hello and welcome. I am Scrapperlock, and this is City of Villains on the Rebirth server. We are with our mastermind, Nightmare Lass, who is level 32 and has 1.7 million XP, 300,000 to go to get to the ne next level, and 138 million infamy. And we are on a story arc for this guy, Mr. G. And now he wants us to arrange our first meeting with our supervillain group. So we're going to enter the mission. If this is anything like the hero one, there's going to be a lot of talking. But there probably will be a fight at some point. So we will keep our buddies with us. Lost the mouse there for a sec. Okay, so speak with Mr. G. He says, ah, Nightmare Lass. As you can see, everyone has been gathered. It's a shame that Bobcat can no longer be an able fighter, but she will do well to help find you information. She will have to, at least. The cat girl has become far too lazy to be a capable fighter. I will, of course, look into ways of fixing that. We are still in control of Vanguard's helicopter. This will allow us to do whatever we wish in the future. Excellent. Now for our first plan. He says, there are several paths that I would suggest you take with our plans. Subjugator 5, of course is a major asset. The power stored within that thing could be devastating when directed at the right target. I believe it's just a matter of finding who to go after. Who who go after with it? I think who we go after first with it. So then one of our other characters says, hey, there's something on the communicator here. They're talking about us. I knew it'd be a good idea to be around all of you. What? So we look at the communicator and now there's a cutscene. This is Wu Yin. He's broadcasting his message to put forth a bounty on Nightmare Lass. Whoever brings Nightmare Lass in alive will be given $20 million, but only if she's alive. Be careful as Nightmare Lass has gathered several Praetorian allies. That will be extremely dangerous. She will use the best of her ability. Never mind my allies, I've got pets. Bounty is set, we will be watching. So now we're going to have to defeat this guy, I guess. S speak with Mr. G again. And he says, this is troubling, Nightmare Last. Very troubling. Our presence is now publicly known. Who would have guessed that Yu Wu Yin would try to do something like this? All right. And he says, myself and the others will work on a proper plan of attack. And unfortunately, we're still on a story arc for this guy. So, um, I'm trying to do everything I can to get off this story arc, but unfortunately, <laughs> they don't need, really know when to stop with these things. So, Transmuter and Bobcat have come up with a proposal of how we can deal with this current scenario. I believe it's quite brilliant myself. All right, what's the available mission? Part one. Ah. <sighs> Oh, wait a minute. I'm not on a story arc for him anymore. Maybe I don't have to take it. Let's ignore that and do another story. Shadowy figure, Simon Omega. Do we have any new contacts? No. Dimitrovich. Can introduce me to a new contact. There we go. Operative Rutger. All right, so I'm going to try Operative Rutger. Hopefully... Actually, guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause it here, and I am going to uh, look up who in this level range is not new since, like, issue 18 or 19, because I don't like these newer story arcs. So let me take a break here, and I'll be right back once I have some more information about who to contact. All right, we're back. It looks like Timothy Raymond and Operative Rutger are older contacts, so I can do either of them. So I'm going to head to uh, Nerve Archipelago and try Timothy Raymond. He's going to have us fighting Rickty. We haven't really done much with Rickty and our pets, so let's go ahead and take a story arc against Rickty and see how we do. I suspect that the really tough part is going to be the drones, and our minions will have a lot of trouble hitting. So we may have to carry some extra accuracy. We'll just have to see. So yeah, guys, I'm just going to try very, very, very hard. 
to avoid any story arcs that were published after issue 18 or so because I, I don't like them. And uh, I it's hard with on the villain side because I haven't really played any of these missions in 15 years. So um, I, I don't know the names of the contacts and which story arcs they give, and I don't know which ones have changed since launch and which ones are the same. Uh, whereas in the hero side, oh no, I'm on his story arc anyway, even though I don't want it. All right, well, I'm ignoring him for now. I, I can't I can't take it anymore. I think I might just call him and complete every single mission because I hate it so much. Um, anyway, I don't know, unfortunately, on the villain side, and this is why, to be honest, I don't think I'm ever going to play the villain side again, is I just, I have a lot of trouble keeping track of who's what. The zones have, like, these weird level ranges. I, I can never remember... The level ranges of the zones, who the contacts are in the zones, who the original contacts were, because I only played them once or twice, especially after level 25 or so. The, I only got one character past like 32, and that was literally in 2005, so it was 15 years ago. So I don't really have a good sense of what's what in this in the villain side, whereas in the hero side, I know who the classic contacts are, Philip and Moreau and stuff. I recognize their names because I played them so much, and I know which are the new story arcs, and I know to avoid t Twin Shot and Eagle Eye and some of the others, because I know I don't like those story arcs, but I really, it's really hard to tell here. So we're just going to have to see. All right, so Lost and Found, this is a story arc with the Richty. Nightmare Lass, greetings. I don't know what you've heard about me, but I know the things that people say. They say I'm crazy. They say I'm amnesiac. Well, maybe they're right. Since I broke free of the Lost, I have really been right in the head. I can't even remember half the things that happened to me while I was with them, and I hate them for that. That's why we're talking. I've learned the location of a Richty soldier I escaped from. If you eliminate Kit Vool, uh, you'll have my eternal gratitude. Commence violence, Kit Vool, destroy. Okay, we're going to go kill Kit Vool. And let's just go ahead and teleport to the mission, since it's pretty far away. By the way, guys, I haven't done anything more with the base, but we now have 158,000 prestige that we have earned for our supergroup, for our base. So that's pretty good for one character who's not even level 35 yet. By the way, since I have my computer, new computer working and everything seems okay with it, I am going to be um, trying to do some more of my brute speed run. I did a little bit of it today. And um, I actually used an XP bonus um, veteran reward so that he earned 25% XP faster, or XP 25% faster. And uh, yeah, so he's already level 16. I recorded some of it. I haven't tried rendering it down to a speed. Uh, like three times speed yet because I don't have enough. If I try to do that, it'll only be about seven minutes of video. So I'm going to try to make it a little longer. I I was doing multiple levels, but I think, oh, this is going to be fun. I think that I'm not going to be able to keep that up because levels are going to take too long. And also when I started it, it was like triple XP weekend. Oh man, if he can hold them, that's going to be awesome. It figures we'd be fighting three different drones. Um, so, anyway, I don't think I'll be able to keep up the multi-levels per episode. So what we'll probably do is one episode, one level per episode. So I'll see if I can, like, compact. So I did level 15 to 16. So I'll do that, two, those two levels together. But I'm going to see if I can compact. Oh, he's going to teleport all over the place, isn't he? Oh, good. He, my guy held him. Curly held him. Good job. Um, I'm going to see if I can come back future levels into like one level per episode. And that'll give us, I don't know, about 30 or 40 episodes of the speed run. I don't know if we're going to want to keep doing it. I mean, I guess it'll be up to you guys. If people like it, I can keep doing it. If not, I'll stop. Okay, so we're trying to eliminate just kill Kid Fool, I guess. 
so this should not be difficult. Unless he's an elite boss, which he might be. Okay, let's go after the communicator. There we go. You are not going to open a portal, buddy. I'm the only, the only no, I am the only one who gets to open portals and summon minions. We're doing pretty well against this, these advanced drones. It's not too bad. Or improved drones, I guess. Rick D. Guardian. Let's teleport him over here so he can't buff his friends. Come on. Why is it not? There we go. Yeah, so that was like an AoE buff, but he was over here when he did it. Nope, it still worked. That's just ridiculous. He still buffed his friends because I guess he started it as he left. It really shouldn't work that way. What I don't like about it is it makes it impossible to be tactical. So you can't even say, well, let's teleport the Guardian over here because he's going to buff them anyway. So what's the point? You may as well just go in. I kind of don't like it when being tactical nets you nothing. I feel like it should net you something. There should be a reward for doing something that's tactically intelligent. It sort of reminds me of the Cairns with um, the Devouring Earth when with Silver Phoenix. Was it Silver Phoenix or, or I guess it was... Um, is this guy trying to run away? I guess it was my um, my stalker, and I was complaining that you know the Cairns make just give like a huge amount of resistance to the Devouring Earth, and they make it so that. How did he know we were here? I don't know. Um, anyway, the Cairns make it so that you can't do any damage, right? They give him a massive amount of resistance. And so, okay, they drop a cairn, I pull them out of the area and make them chase me. That's good tactics. It pulls them out of their buff range. And um, so that's a good thing, but it doesn't matter because then they just drop the next cairn down because their recharge time on it is like three seconds. And so, you know, you, you destroy the cairn, they drop another one. You pull them out, they drop another one. So it's like, okay, well, then I can't really be tactical. I, you're basically forcing me to fight in the cairn no matter what I do, so what's the point of doing anything tactical? And I think the same thing is true with the Rikdi. If the Guardian's going to buff his neighbors, even when I pull him out of the group, what's the point of pulling him out of the group? So you're, you're making it so that the tactic can't work. It almost feels like, you know, sort of the, the DM who's decided this villain is going to get away. And no matter what the character, what the characters do, what the players do, no matter how good their plan is, the villain's just going to get away. And yeah, in my time when I was a new DM and I was a kid, I used to do that. But as an adult, I don't. And I really feel like the designers should have done something different with this. So that if you do something tactical, it can work. So anyway, well, that's just my rant about tactics. Let's go ahead and contact Timothy Raymond. All right, so we got to head down. I'm going to pause it here, and I'll bring you back when we are with Timothy. All right, folks, we are back. And Timothy says, you've made the Rikti pay for destroying my life. Somehow I don't feel sated. I guess peace is elusive, huh, Nightmare Lass? I want to see the Rikti pay more. All right, what do you want to do? Arachnos agents have often come to my aid. They're helping me get closer to uncovering the lost fragments of my past. But right now they're in trouble. Cray security forces are attacking an Arachnos lab, bent on stealing their technology. Go save the Arachnos lab. Okay. Alright guys, I'll head over there and I'll bring you back when we are at the lab. Alright, we're back and I hope I have fixed sound. I was trying to record the sound coming through my speakers. I wasn't trying to. OBS was set to do that because of something I reported earlier today through the speakers and I forgot to reset it when I plugged my headphones in. So if you haven't heard any background noise, I do apologize for that. It should be fixed now. Alright, so now we're going to go defeat all Kray. 
and this will probably be our last mission for today. One thing I'm going to definitely start doing is not not recording every single story arc. I will not record the one with Mr. G because I'm going to hate it and I'll just be grumbling all the time so there's no point to recording that. So we'll do this story arc for um, this lost guy. What's his name? Timothy. Right? We'll do his story arc and when we're done I will stop recording and I'll do Mr. G and then after we're done with Mr. G I'll come back. By then we'll probably be very close to level 33 and we will record some more. I had intended, and I think I had pretty much been doing every, kind of every other story arc with this character, and I certainly had intended to do that, but I got so excited to have my computer back yesterday that I didn't even think about that. I'm just so glad to have it back. This is a defeat all, so it really doesn't matter which way we go through this lab. We're going to have to defeat everybody no matter what. So I'm not going to worry about being like super efficient with the map because we're going to have to crawl over every inch of it. Every pixel. Doing well so far against the Kray, I will say that. Yeah, we haven't done that much against the Kray. I'm not sure how we're going to do against things like Paragon Protectors. They could be extremely difficult. Yeah, I'm sort of having a hard time picturing this. I know Masterminds are generally thought of as being like easy mode because their pets just crush everything. But your pets are actually not that powerful individually. And I feel like the Paragon Protectors and enemies like that could very well be a major Achilles heel of a Mastermind. I just don't know. We'll have to see. Right? Because once they go into their, like, moment of glory or whatever it is, where you can't hit them and if you hit them you don't do any damage, it's going to be really hard to get my pets off of them so that we don't waste time and effort trying to attack an invincible guy. Like a literally invincible guy. Okay, I moved in too fast and I'm being attacked. So let's let my minions protect me. You can see that they're doing a number on these guys. So if it's not if it's not the Paragon Protectors or maybe the Cray Lieutenant tanks and the boss tanks, we're fine, no problem at all. Alright, that was like a double spawn. Good job guys. And now we're at the elevators. So we go up to the next level. Should I hit the medics first because they heal? And then we can go after things like the riot guards. So my guys do pretty well against plus one minions. The question really is how are they going to do against like plus one Kray Voltaic tanks and stuff? I don't really know. I guess we'll find out. At this level, you don't get as many of those. You get a lot more of the riot guards. And then the tougher guys come in more at the in the higher 30s, at least on the hero side. see how much damage they do and this this kind of thing is why people feel that masterminds are easy mode but the real problem is against the really tough villains like the elite bosses our minions are just tissue paper right because they're 
two levels below me. So if it's a plus one boss, they're three levels below the boss, which means that the boss would con, like, purple to them. Deep purple. Okay, more guys. And we need to figure out the reason for the raid, so there will probably be a glowy. Protect your mistress, my friends. My demons. You can see how slowly they're moving. That's because of the ice debuff. Look how look at him. He's like the six million dollar man in that old 70s show. Where they would like when they were running fast, they would special effect it by having them run in slow motion, which is sort of a really weird choice, but in those days they didn't have the ability to really make the speed up look good the way they can now with something like the Flash or um, Superman doing super speed, but you know, in the 1970s they really didn't have a good way to do that so they made it slow motion instead and you know, they would jump, like do their super basically super bionic jump and they would go up really slowly and then come down really slowly and there would be this cool like synthesizer sound like as they went up and down. It was really funny. It was a good show. I used to like this show. The, both the $6 million man and the bionic woman. I used to enjoy those shows. Who is that that played that? Lee Majors played the $6 million man and um, Lindsay Wagner played the bionic woman. Jamie, Jamie Summers, I think her name was, and he was Steve Austin. I used to like those shows when I was a kid. I should probably rent or buy them. At least the first season of each one and watch and see. I was telling my mom today, I feel like I've become... I'm a, I'm a child of the 70s and I feel like I've, I'm going back to the 70s. I've been watching old episodes of the show Columbo which started in the late 60s, early 70s. I'm watching this 1974 season right now. Big fan of that show, and Peter Falk, who played Columbo. I've also been watching the Mary Tyler Moore show, which um, I was really young when that first came out. But I remember watching like the last couple of seasons with my parents back in like the late 70s when I was you know six or seven, eight years old. And I always liked Mary Tyler Moore. And I always liked uh, a lot of the other char characters and the actors, Ed Asner, um, Ted Knight. There were some really good comedic actors on that show. So I've been watching that too. And uh, I was telling my mom I've been making some of her old recipes. I picked them up when uh, I was at her place on Christmas. And um, she had this whole like box of recipes. And I went through it and I took out the ones I thought I might maybe like to make someday. And made pictures of them on my cell phone and so I've got them and um, I've made a couple of her old recipes and I was talking about another one that I'm going to be making hopefully this week if I can get what I need from the supermarket and I said I feel like I'm just going back and reliving the 70s I have you know, been watching these 1970s TV shows and I've been making the food that she used to bake or cook for us in the 1970s I mean, she used to do it later, too, you know, in the 80s and 90s as well, but most of my memory of that food comes from the 70s when I was a kid. That's how I learned to like it. And so, um, yeah, I feel like in this weird way I'm going about this strange reliving of the 1970s, both in terms of the entertainment that I watch and the food that I've been eating. And... I guess you can tell I'm a big fan of nostalgia because I'm playing a game from the early 2000s. Although, obviously, computer games in the 70s, well, all you had was Pong at home, and then in the arcade you had Space Invaders and Asteroids and maybe Missile Command. I'm not sure if that came out in the 70s or the early 80s. I think it had Space Invaders was probably very late 70s or 1980, but I remember having Pong. Our, well, the version we had was called Super Pong. 
And um, because it didn't just have Pong, it had like doubles Pong and it had Catch, which was like a reverse Pong. So regular Pong, it's this little square, a little rectangle that you move back and forth and the ball, if it hits the rectangle, reflects back. And Catch, it was like the whole side of the screen was a block except a little reverse, like a little rectangle that was blank. And so the idea of that was that you had to make it go through the hole, essentially. So what it was doing was it turned the whole side of the screen solid and then the paddle, instead of being the thing that reflected the ball, was the hole. And you had to get it in there. And, um, and I can't remember what the fourth game was, but it was all basically variants on Pong. Oh, I remember the fourth game was basketball. There was one side where it would go big and small, and then the other side where you just had to throw it over or something. So it was basically four different versions of Pong, and that's why they called it quote-unquote Super Pong. That was the video game situation in the 1970s when I was a kid. City of Heroes is a far cry from that. Alright, so we got a clue, and the clue says... There's footage downloaded from Arachno's computer showing hideous experiments being performed on members of the Lost Kids. And we know from our City of Heroes side that the Richti are experimenting on humans, turning them into Lost because the Richti are the humans of their world mutated. And they're trying to make the same mutation happen to the humans of our world. So let's give a call to Timothy Raymond. And he says, Well done, Nightmare Lass. Arachnos, my sworn friends, this in controvertible. They've shown such an interest in helping you recover my memory. I'm glad to be able to repay them. I'm pretty sure the Arachnos don't give a darn about his memory. They want something from him. So they're giving him his back his memory so they can get what they want. Not sure what it is that they want, but they certainly are not the sorts to do things altruistically. Alright folks, I think we're going to stop there. It's been a good episode. Until next time, I am Scarberlock, and this has been City of Heroes on the Rebirth server.